we are continuing our series today called God Is. And in this series, we are looking at some of the attributes of God. We looked at his love, we looked at his light, we looked at his jealousy. Wow, that was an interesting one last week. And the reason why we're looking at who God is is because mature faith is built on the who of God, not so much the what of God. That a, a mature faith is trusting who, the person, the fellowship, the relationship, the personality, the character of God. Whereas immature faith looks at what God does, his performance. It looks at the results, the actions, my needs. Mature faith says, God, what can I do for you? Immature says, what have you done for me lately? It's a whole different approach to faith. When faith is built on a person as opposed to a performance. Some of you grew up that way. Where your love, the love from your parents wasn't built on the person of who you are. But the performance of who, what you did. And so then you only felt loved if you did good. Come on now. You were a good boy or a good girl because you did good things. And so because of that. You measure yourself based on how well you do. God doesn't measure. God knows he is who he is. God didn't say to Moses, hey, Moses, uh, I am what I do. God says, I am who I am. Because God's point was, who I am is enough for you. Hmm. So immature faith will bail on God if he doesn't do things the way I want. But when my faith is placed in a person, when I trust in that person, regardless of what's going on in my life, that's unshakable. Because I know in whom I believe that he is able. And that's the place that we want to be. We want to be a church that worships God regardless of what's going on in our lives. So last week's message, like I said, was called God is Jealous. And we learned that God did all he could to win us to himself. And he's fiercely protective of that relationship. Even to the point where he will not tolerate our affection for other idols. Amen. Today's topic is God is unchanging. God is unchanging. What does that mean? This, this topic is so important because it, it means this, that if the God of the Bible is not the God we serve today, then we can't trust him. If we read the word and we think that was those days, but what about now, then there's something wrong, our faith is misaligned. We have to understand that the God who was, he is, and he forever will be. That uh, there's a song that says, if he did it before, he'll do it again. Same God that, 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 same God right now, same God back then. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, hey, you know what? It's not a hymn, so I didn't remember. No, no, it's good. <laughs> so the Bible is only relevant to our lives if God is unchanging. The fact that God is unchanging is what we anchor our faith in. Is the, is the fact that he's unchanging is what makes our faith so strong. And understanding that God is unchanging impacts how I respond to him. I want to tell you a story. Um, true story. It's from my life. In January 1989, I was 19 years old. I was about to enter my final semester of Bible school. My sister, Sarah, was 15 Thank God she was saved. Hallelujah. And we were at her small group leader's home. And uh, we received a phone call. And the phone call we received was that our mother was in the hospital. She had overdosed on crack cocaine. She thought in her state that something was crawling under her skin on its way to her heart. And so, in an attempt to stop it, she cut open her arms to try and get rid of the thing. And in that, they found her losing blood, dying. Rushed her to the hospital. She was overdosed and losing blood. And we were 19, 15, up at somebody else's house. And we got the news. And at that moment... 
in shock. We didn't know what to do. And so we walked into one of the bedrooms at our small group leader's home. And we started to sing. We started to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. I will dance in the streets of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the hills of Mount Zion. I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously and he is alive forever. We found every single song we could find, we could ever think about. And we just sang and we worshipped and we sang and we worshipped. Because we were brought up in this church. It was a charismatic church and people thought, man, those people are part of this cult or something. Because our preacher would teach and teach and teach about worshiping God no matter what, no matter what, no matter what. God is still worthy. No matter what, God is still worthy. No matter what, God is still worthy. And in that moment, we're 15 and 19, and we weren't old enough to know any different than God must be God. And if he's God, then he's still worthy of our praise. So let's just worship him in this moment. What else were we going to do? We're kids. We didn't have power to do anything ourselves. All we could do was worship. Worship. David said, Psalm 34 verse 1, he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. What? How can you say that? How can you say all times? How can you say at all times? That makes no sense. What are you talking about, David? Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, what is he talking about always? How can you say always? Don't you understand what I'm going through? Don't you understand that life gets tough? Don't you understand that things get hard? Don't you understand that there are times when I feel like I don't have any strength left, when the pain is too much to bear? How can you say to bless the Lord then? Listen, David wasn't saying that when he was like in some Ritz Carlton or some throne room. That was, David was saying that when he was in a cave running from his father-in-law who was the king who was trying to kill him. Paul wasn't saying that on some beach in the Bahamas. Paul was saying that when he was in a Roman prison. His hands and his feet were locked in stocks. He couldn't move. He had Roman guards on each side. It's the worst prison in the known world at the time. And he says to the person who is writing, write these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Listen, that's not even enough. Again, I say, rejoice. Why? Because both men understood this one principle that made all the difference in the world. That my worship should be based on the unchanging God, not on my changing circumstance. My worship should be based on the unchanging nature of God, not the changing nature of my circumstance. That regardless of what my mother was going through, or regardless of what you're going through, he is still God. He is still mighty. He is still good. He is still loving. He is still all-knowing. He is still the creator. He is still worthy of our praise. He's still God. He's still God. He's still God. Rick Warren said this, the deepest level of worship is praising God in spite of our pain. Thanking God during, tri during a trial, trusting him when tempted, surrendering when suffering, and loving him when he seems distant. Listen, the worship, the worship value increases the harder the things you're going through. Can I tell you this? The deepest place of worship is when it's sacrificial. When it's hard to do. Look, anybody can praise on the mountaintop, but who's going to sing in the valley? Anybody can praise when things are going well. Anybody can rejoice when things are, when you got the bonus. Man, it's so easy when you get that bonus. To say, oh, praise God. Hallelujah. 
Like when Pastor Evan said, oh man, today we're going to bless Pastor Trey. Oh man, this is the day. <laughs> this is, of course, it's so easy to do it then. But what when you don't see that? What when things are tough? What when, like they say in that song, uh, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. <laughs> but you have never failed me yet. What about those times? Can we praise in the midst of the storm? Can we praise when it's raining on our face and when our tears are outlasting the rain? It's just coming down. Can we praise in those times? Because regardless of how I feel, regardless of how I feel, regardless of how I feel or how things seem or what is happening, God is still God. I am not, but he is. And because he still is, then he still deserves our praise. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Now, the theological term for what I'm talking about is called immutable. God is immutable. 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 Uh, Pastor Paul and I were talking about this this week. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't shut God up. You know, because, don't worry. This is, like a, this is a bad joke. It's a really bad joke. Uh, but you know, on the TV thing, you have the thing that says mute. So God is immutable, so you can't shut him. All right, that's not right. Anyway, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's a long, long story. But the point is this. Immutable means unchanging over time. Unchanging over time. God, you think about this. God doesn't grow older. He doesn't grow wiser. He doesn't grow stronger. He doesn't, go, he doesn't grow in any way. God has no potential. Let this sink. He has no potential. Because potential means that there's something unused and you can now increase. God is as God as God can be. There is no more for him to get. He is maxed out and was maxed out from the time everlasting. There is no beginning, there is no end to him. He is all in all in all. God doesn't need anything to make him improve. God never says, ah, I didn't see that coming. God doesn't say, wow, that's new. God knows it all. Amen? James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change. God does not change. What, do, what does it mean God does not change? Number one, God's promises do not change. Someone say, God's promises do not change. God doesn't make a mistake when he speaks and so, or says what he doesn't mean. He's not hasty. He doesn't make regretful decisions. He's not schizophrenic. God knows his mind. And so when he speaks, he really means what he says. When he makes a promise, he really knew what he was saying at the time he made a promise. Some of us have lived in a life of broken promises and we don't realize that if God said it, then it must be true. And therefore I can trust him no matter what I'm going through. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man. So he does not lie, thank God. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Mm. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. In other words, there is no promise that God has made that he's telling you no about. He says, if you're in Christ, every promise that God has made, he has a resounding yes behind it. So even though my mom was in the hospital, I was able to worship God because I had a promise from God. There's a promise. When I got saved, my father was a Rastafarian. My mother was a drug addict. I was in a world that just nothing seemed to have lined up with the word of God. And one day I was reading my Bible and there was a story in the book of Acts. And it was a story of a guy named Paul and his friend named Silas. And both of them were arrested and put into a prison cell. And while they were in the prison cell, they started to worship in the middle of the prison cell. I want you to hear me. They were worshiping in the middle of the prison cell. 
bell. It said at midnight, they started to pray and to praise. And then the jail started to rumble and the doors flung open and the prison guard was about to kill himself. And Paul says, hold on, don't do it. And the man said, what shall I do to be saved? And he said these words, and this was my promise. He said, if you shall believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household... Paul it said, you and your household shall be saved. I said, what? I said, but wait, I believe. So if I believe, that means me and my, come on now, that was my promise. God put that in my heart and I said, oh my God, that's my promise. So here it was, I was in that room with my sister, hands raised, worshiping God. And I remembered that God's promise was, you and your Come on, somebody, you and your... So I said, man, that's my promise. I'm going to worship God because his promise doesn't change even though it looks like death was on the door. I had a promise. I was going to hold on to it because the promise don't change. My circumstance change, but his promise doesn't change because God is unchanging. And if he said it, won't he do it? Come on now. You see, I can't worship based on what I see. I've got to worship based on what I believe. <laughs> I can't worship based on what I see. I have to worship based on what I believe. You see, worship is an act of faith. Worship is an act of trust. Worship is an act of, look, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to bless you anyway. God's promises do not change. Here's the other thing. God's personality does not change. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. I remember Pastor Eben used that scripture one time to tell Pastor Sarah why he couldn't change the diaper of heaven. He said, I'm like the Lord, I changeth not. Hallelujah. How many of you know that's a misuse of scripture, amen? <laughs> He's always the same. He's always the same, this God. He's the same God. That's why sometimes we read the Old Testament and say, hey, man, God was so angry back then. He killed so many people. Man, he, he changed in the New Testament. He didn't change. Jesus came. He didn't change. Jesus that's why we did God is light. Because God still hates sin. God still hates sin. But Jesus said, let me die for them, Lord. Let me die for them, Father. Let me take their place. Put the punishment that you would have given them on me. Let me take the punishment so that they won't have to receive the punishment for their sin. So God hasn't changed. His personality hasn't changed. Who he is hasn't changed. Hebrews 11, uh, 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. It's not going to change. Regardless of what you're going through, you have to remind yourself of what you know about God. You have to remind yourself he's merciful. You have to remind yourself he's gracious. You have to remind yourself he's patient. He is good. He loves me. He is with me. He knows what I'm going through. He cares for me. He has a plan for me. He has a purpose for me. He has not given up on me. He never gives up on his sheep. He always goes and finds them out. He's going to help me. He's got, there's no mountain he won't climb up, no wall that he won't kick down. No, he, this is God we're talking about. And he's on my side. He hasn't changed. And I haven't done anything for him to change. Because a lot of us think that we're in the situation because of something we did. Jesus took the punishment. He's not punishing you anymore. Huh. I, I had uh, I have two kids. Or I have three. But at a time. <laughs> Sorry. At the time I had two. And they're only 14 months apart. I walked in one day and there was something that was broken. I don't remember what it was. But I was very upset. Very upset with whoever broke it. So I started to question the two of them. Who, who broke this? You know, just like, monster came out. 
And so everybody's quiet. Nobody's saying anything. And then Joshua, sweet little Joshua. Josh is so sweet. Josh is like, ah, because Josh just want me to be, not be angry anymore. So Joshua said, I did it. So man, I, I spank Joshua, send you to your room, da, 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 all that. About two hours later, Amanda comes and says, Daddy, I was really the one who did it. <sighs> By that time, I was done being angry. <laughs> My anger was satisfied. I dealt with it. I could, Amanda, don't do that again, all right? Can you just, just when, when it's you, when you do the wrong thing, just own up to it and don't do that again. How many of you know that Joshua took the punishment that was really due to her? Amen. And guess what? I didn't have any punishment left to give to Amanda. Man, I'm really sorry, Josh. I know it wasn't your fault, but hey. Such is life. Oh, we know, right? That's what Jesus did. Jesus took our punishment. And so the, the anger of God is satisfied in him. Don't walk around thinking, oh, God is punishing me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amen. Some of you need to clap for that right there because that's setting you free. Amen. My worship must be based on who God is, not what he's doing. Because the truth is, you don't know what he's doing. Hear me. You don't know what he's doing. You don't know what he's working out in the background. You don't know what kind of activity is taking place unbeknown to you. You don't know who is setting up and who is raising up and who is talking to. You don't know what God is doing. So you can't base your worship on what he's doing. You have to base it on who he is and that you just know that if he is the same God, he's going to get me out of this. Don't wait for the victory to start the praise. <laughs> you got to praise before you see the results. Hallelujah. God's promises don't change. His, his, his personality doesn't change. God's power does not change. God's power does not change. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth, watch this, by your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. There is nothing too hard for you. God is powerful enough to change my situation that is why I should praise him in it God is powerful enough to change my situation. God there is enough power in God to change whatever you're going through right now amen amen I believe that the God who does not change has enough power to change what I'm going through the God who does not change has enough power to change. You know, the Hebrew boys said this. I love this. The Hebrew boys are like, this is my favorite, one of my favorite stories. The Hebrew boy says, listen, oh king, they were about to throw them into the fire. The, the, the Hebrew boy says, king, let me tell you something. Our God is able to deliver us from this fire. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. We're going to worship him. We're going to honor him. We're going to bless him. Whether he delivers us or not, let me tell you something. I trust in who he is. I'm not even concerned about that. Listen, I know he can do it. I know he can do it. But even if he doesn't do it the way I want him to, even if he doesn't do it the way I'm expecting, even if he doesn't do it the way I planned in my head, the way I would want it. If I was God, I would do this. Even if he does not do that, I'm going to worship him right where I'm at. God doesn't change. So your worship shouldn't change. Your praise shouldn't change. Your trust shouldn't change. Your obedience shouldn't change. Your confession, it shouldn't change. 
He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's still worthy no matter what's happening in your life. He is still on the throne. Man, we used to say that a lot when I was a younger Christian. Man, God is still on the throne. Every time something bad would happen, we'd say, God is still on the throne. You remember that? We used to say it all the time. We'd be like, hey, man, you know what? God is still on the throne. Man, that was like a confession all the time because things didn't look so good sometimes. And we would just say, God is still on the throne. Man, my, my old pastor, Pastor David, he wrote a song. He says, when everything looks wrong, it's going right. When everything looks wrong, <laughs> it's going right. Don't change your praise. Here's, here's the fourth thing. His, his promises don't change. His personality doesn't change. His power doesn't change. Here's the fourth thing. His purposes do not change. His purposes do not change. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many plans are in a man's mind, but it is the Lord's purposes for him that will stand. That's the amplified version. He says, it's the Lord's purposes for him that will stand. The Lord's purposes for him that will stand. The Lord's purpose for you is going to last. Uh, it, it, you know what? It, this, there's this... Uh, prophet by the name of Jonah who decided he was going to run away from the purposes of the Lord. And so he started to run to this place called Tarshish and he was on a ship and the storm started to go around and, and the people who were not even Christians, not even Jews, not even believing in God decided to figure out, hey, what's going on? Jonah was the problem. Jonah was running from the purpose of God in his life and they threw him overboard. A fish caught him, took him back to the place he was supposed to go and even though Jonah was rebellious, God says, my purpose for you has not changed. It doesn't matter how far you've been. God says my purpose is still the same. Because some of us are at a place where we feel like I'm going through what I'm going through because I've abandoned God. I've turned my back on God. And God says, I've not abandoned you though. My purpose for you is still real today as it was back then. The thing you thought I called you to, I still have that call on your life. You see, Romans says that the, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. It means he can't take them back. God can't take back his word. If God didn't want it, he shouldn't have said it. If he didn't mean it, he shouldn't have said it. Because everybody knows, once a king makes a declaration, there ain't no turning back. And so, his purposes have not changed. No matter what's happening around you, his purposes remain the same. His purpose hasn't changed, even if your circumstance has. Listen, my worship must be based on the state of his heart toward me, not the state of my heart in the situation. I'm going to say that again. My worship must be based on the state of his heart toward me, not the state of my heart in the situation. I'm going to say it again. My worship must be based on the state of his heart Towards me, not the state of my heart in the situation. Because when my heart is trembling, that's when I need to praise. When my heart is uncertain, that's when I need to praise. When my heart is, is worried, that's when I need to pray, praise. When my heart is fearful, that's when I need to praise. When my heart is in a place of God, where are you? That's when I need to praise. My heart can't determine my praise. I've got to be determined by my faith. My faith is what needs to determine my praise. Spurgeon said this, God is too good to be unkind. He is too wise to be confused. If I cannot trace his hand, I can always trust his heart. His heart. So, so how do we... How do we stay? How do we worship in our circumstance? Number one, remove outwardly. We've got to get away from the things or people that remind 
us of the problem that we face and focus on God. Sometimes we need to retreat. Sometimes we need to get away. Sometimes you need to cut off some people around you for this season because right now they're not adding anything to you. They're just taking away. Hello. All the people who say, you know what I would do? You know what I would do? Now, if I was you, hmm, those people, you got to get away from them. Number two, you got to reflect inwardly. Think about how God has delivered you in the past. Start looking back because sometimes like the children of Israel, we forget. We forget what he did and how he brought us out. Number three, rehearse. Rehearse verbally. What does God's word say about him and about his ability to solve your problem? For me it was, as for me and my household, they shall be saved. That was what I rehearsed verbally. Amen? Number four, recite fervently. What do I mean, I mean by that? Man, put some emotion behind it now. Start to sing and speak and pray and listen to songs that are going to talk about and build your faith. And start to just, you just start getting intense with it. Don't, this is not just like, look, God gave you emotions because he wants that passion to be used for his goodness. Amen? And for his glory. And so, my mom was finally released from the hospital. A few weeks later. She was at my graduation, Bible school graduation, and she's high. Bible school, I'm up here, and I'm looking down, and she walks in, and I think, oh, no. Okay, she's high, and I'm trying to be holy. This is Bible school. Not long after that. I'm graduated summer now. And what happens? She gets arrested. Why? Drug raid. Drug bust on her apartment. Arrested. Put in jail. And what do I do? What do I do? I worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. Why? Because in that moment, it wasn't my circumstance that was determining my worship. It was who God is. And so I'm praying and I'm worshiping and God said, listen, this is a Jonah situation. I'm giving her one more chance. I'm giving her one more chance. My purpose for her hasn't changed. My power for her hasn't changed. My personality hasn't changed. My promises haven't changed. I'm giving her a chance. You got to know it hasn't changed. And I'm praying, and she gets, she gets uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pay, and she comes out, and, and she meets with my pastor, and he starts talking to her, and he invites my sister up, and she leads her to the Lord, and, and she gets saved. Yeah. <laughs> she gets saved. Instantly delivered from drugs. Instantly delivered from crack. Instantly delivered from cocaine. Instantly delivered. And then, and then the police would not show up to the court hearings, and so they threw out the case. And she, she serves in our church, and she starts a ministry to the inner city, and hundreds of people get saved. Hundreds of people start to come to know the Lord. Hundreds of people are, are there, and they're, they're, they're getting in church because now she's a completely different person. And then one day, I'm at college, in my dorm, and I'm, I'm sleeping. It's the middle of the afternoon. Because when you're a college kid, and you're up all night studying, and then you have a morning class, then you do sleep. And I'm sleeping. And the janitor comes to the door and knocks. And he has this sad look on his face. And he says, uh, there's a call for you. A call? It's weird. There's only one room in the whole dorm. Each dorm just has a phone. I forward this call to my, the dorm room. I pick it up. And it's my dad on the phone. And he says, your mother is dead. I said, what? I said, yeah. She was murdered. She was cut up. They broke into her house. She was killed. In that moment, 
I'm in shock. I hump the phone. I walk into the room. And I'm weak. And there's only one thing I know to do at this point. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. The story doesn't even end there. <laughs> because at her funeral, my stepmom gives her life to the Lord. And she's this big reggae singer, and all of a sudden she goes, I'm only going to sing gospel from now on. What in the world is going on? And then my dad gets saved. And my dad is this huge producer and this huge, just like this, this icon in reggae music. And he's this huge guy. And then he decides at some point that, hey, I'm just going to Christian events. And, 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 then, and then Papa San gets saved. And Junior Tucker gets saved. And Junior Moore gets saved. And all these things, are, they start getting saved. And all of a sudden, it's, it's no longer just me and my household. No, it's, it's me and, and them and them and their household and their household and their household and their household and and I'm just going God I, I worship you I, I don't know what else to do but I worship you it, it, I can't look at my circumstance I've got to look at who God is and you may be going through something right now and you're going man I find it hard to worship because of my circumstance, I'm going to invite you, if, if you just go, you know what, I really need to worship God in the midst of what I'm going through right now. To stand on your feet and join me. To lift your hands. To just sing along with us. I was just saying, I worship you. Go for it, Paul. Almighty God. There is none like you, Lord. There is none like you. Oh, God, I worship you. I worship you. Prince of, peace. Oh, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. That is what I want to do. Yes. I give you praise. For you are my I give you praise. 